Okay. It is 12.02 p.m. Eastern time. Let's get going. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining the webinar we're doing today. My name is Braden Dennis, co-founder, CEO of FinChat. Website is finchat.io. And we've been working with uh, compounding quality here. I'm sure you've seen his uh, anonymous Warren Buffett face on the <laughs> interwebs, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, mostly. You you have over 300,000 followers on Twitter at this point now. Is it over 100,000 on LinkedIn? It's it's just quite an yeah, impressive exactly. rise. Exactly. So, so three, 4,000 people more. And I guess we hit uh, 500,000 people across social media. So uh, wow. let's see how things evolve. That's brilliant. Well, congratulations. Um, for some housekeeping items here, the Q&A is how we're going to uh, run the discussion here. And you can upvote Q&A questions that you see in there. Ryan Henderson, who's on the chat here, will be looking at those and, and picking some really good ones, ones that are being upvoted. So go ahead and use the Q&A rather than the chat, which is, is currently disabled. We're going to take questions as they come in, but also leave at least half of this session for questions, Q&A, um, to go through different companies and just, just discuss quality investing. So we're going to do a presentation for the, the first half and then leave lots of time for those Q&As so you can throw them in there. Uh, Peter, let's get started. Uh, Peter, aka Compounding Quality, the secret's out uh, that your name is Peter. Uh, Indeed. <laughs> did uh, LinkedIn make you go unanonymous? How did that How did that decision go? I guess you're you're talking about money and talking about investments, right? So so just to do the right thing, to do the ethical thing, I think that all, everyone and definitely the partners of Compound Equality have the rights to know who I am. And I think that honesty and integrity is so important. So so people deserve to know what I am, who I am to. I also have skin in the game. So so I guess it was really important, and uh, people deserve to know that. I was in good old Omaha, Nebraska for the Berkshire Hathaway shareholder meeting last year, last spring. And I was at a restaurant bar type thing for an event. And I met you and we're sitting down and you go, oh, by the way, I'm compounding quality on, on Twitter. I think you follow me. <laughs> and I had to do like a triple take because I mean, you, You've you've become a big deal on the interwebs for for investors, both you know professional investors, self directed investors, retail investors alike. So, um, let's start there before the presentation. What is your background? Uh, you worked as a portfolio manager in Europe. Why did you decide to start sharing information online um, from your you know professional background, portfolio management expertise to explaining things in simple concepts. So why did you originally start with sharing mm -hmm. content online? I guess, I guess two things. First thing is I always wanted to, to be a teacher. So as Charlie Munger said, well, the best thing a human being can do is to help another human being know more, right? So that's one thing. Second thing, I joined the industry and I was from the beginning before I joined actually quite skeptical because what you hear that there are so many short-term incentives, high costs, making decisions that, that fill your own pockets at the cost of your clients. And to me, I felt that in some way, at least it was true. So you weren't doing the, the right thing, weren't living in an honest way, in an integral way. So, so that's not something I want to become a part of, to, to generally help other people, which is why I just started compounding quality for film. And, and to to try to provide value for other people. And, and here we are right now and doing this full time. So uh, really grateful for that. And, and just forming a community with like-minded investors is something really beautiful. Well, I'm excited for this presentation because I consider myself a, a, a quality investor, maybe a growth at a reasonable type, growth at a reasonable price type uh, investor. So without... You know, any further delay, let's get into what is quality investing uh, and some of the slides that you've prepared. And I think that that will be instructive on our uh, on our conversation here. Before reminder, I, we just had another couple hundred participants join in. 
The chat is disabled. We're going to use the Q&A. So it's going to be very interactive in the second half of this webinar. So use the Q&A and uh, Ryan Henderson here as one of the panelists will, will triage those questions accordingly. All right, Peter, Perfect. the floor is yours. Perfect. Thank you for the, for the great introduction. And if everything went right, you can now see uh, the screen. So the presentation. We will do the presentation for 30 minutes, 35 minutes, and uh, I think it will be beneficial for all of us to, to keep it as interactive as possible. So if you have certain questions at a certain slide, feel free to, to ask it in the Q&A. And if uh, Ryan uh, from FinChat could help me and, and ask the question in that case, that would be really good. Now, quality investing, compounding quality, let the magic of compounding do the work for you via investing in quality stocks. That's exactly the topic uh, we will talk about today and also how you can use FinChat to, to find these stocks and to build and maintain your portfolio. I'll keep this one short. So I guess that most people know who compounding quality is. Active on social media and also on the website where you can basically, yeah, where I write three articles a week uh, regarding investments. You can see my portfolio, investment cases and stuff like that. So what will you learn over the next few minutes? Well, first thing we will go over is the essence of quality investing. What is quality investing all about? And does it work? Next step, obviously, how can you find these kind of companies? How can you find quality stocks? And how can FinChat help you to, to, to find those ones and to screen for these kind of companies? We will also go a bit deeper in the portfolio give you some uh, examples and at the end there is some uh, some gift for you so to go to the introduction well when you would need to summarize quality investing in one sentence quality investing basically is all about investing in the best companies in the world so many of you will know the quote from Warren Buffett it's far better to buy a wonderful company at a fair price than a fair company at a wonderful price and that's exactly what quality investing is all about. So when you need to summarize it in three steps, and by the way, that's based on Warren Buffett, Wells on the, other, on the one hand, and Terry Smith from Fundsmith on the other hand, well, you try to buy wonderful companies, you try to buy those wonderful companies led by outstanding managers. And obviously the market often recognizes that those are great businesses, right? So then the, the, the magic is in trying to buy those wonderful companies led by outstanding managers at a fair price. So that's what quality investing is all about. Next question you can ask yourself, obviously, is, okay, that's interesting, but does it work? And the short answer here is yes. And I'm not here today to say that quality investing is the only investment style you can use because there are multiple roads that lead to Rome. But quality investing is definitely an investment style that worked really well in the past. Just take, for example, the MSCI World Quality Index. It's an index based on the regular MSCI World Index, but that just picks the quality stocks within the list. Well, this list outperformed by 3.5% per year on average. Same goes for the Morningstar White Moat Index. So this index that only consists of companies with a sustainable competitive advantage, all performed by 4.2% per year on average. And obviously compounding quality, uh, practice what you preach. We also have our own investable universe, which is available on the website with 148 quality companies right now. Well, this list are performed by 6% per year since 2005. And as you all know, well, it's the case for professional investors, but also for, for non-professionals. For retail investors, almost no investor is able to, to perform like the market, right? Almost everyone underperforms. And just following these easy steps, and by the way, there are uh, actually ETFs who track the MSCI World Quality Index and the Morningstar White Moat Index. Just doing that allows you to, to outperform by, by 3 to 4% or even more. And when you do that, well, you're among the best investors in the world. So that's very interesting. One so thing I'd like to add here, Peter, is, is just really how selective some of these index indices are. I just Absolutely. looked here on Morningstar Wide Moat Focus. 
the holdings account, uh, for equity holdings is only 49. So, you know, quality investing, it works really, really well when your bounds and, you know, hurdle rate and bar for quality is super, super high. And I'm, I'm sure you'll talk more about that. Absolutely. And you're exactly right, uh, Brain. Also for compounding quality, for example, we have an investable universe of 150 stocks. But worldwide, there are 60,000 listed stocks. And I think that's the, the beautiful thing and the most important thing. What you try to do is you try to be very selective with very strict criteria. And, and by doing that, you hope that your investable universe as a whole, so the companies that still remain after using criteria, should already outperform the market. And based on that, you are building your portfolio and hopefully to, to create extra alpha. So I uh, couldn't agree more, I guess. Now, we learned about what quality investing is. We told you that quality investing works in the long term. Next step, obviously, most important one maybe, is how can you find these kind of companies? How to find quality stocks? And when you look at the compounding stock, you will notice that they always have six criteria. Those are very important, uh, which is also why we will go over them over the next few minutes. Now, which criteria do you have? First part is competitive advantage or moat. You will never invest in a company that doesn't have a moat. Second part, skin in the game. So where the founder, the family, and so on are still involved in the business. Third point, low capital intensity. The less capital a company needs, the better. Four, great capital allocation. So it's the decision about what management does with the free cash flow it generates. Capital allocation together with the moat is probably, those are both the two most important things uh, for quality investors. Five, I guess very straightforward, high profitability. And then last but not least, a secular trend or an attractive growth. So six very important characteristics and we will go over them um, over the next few minutes. So first point, study the moat or the competitive advantage. So as a quality investor, you will never invest in the next big thing, but instead you want to invest in companies that have already won. So you want to invest in a company that is doing something unique and where it's really hard for competitors to take away market share from them. Now, how can you study this? How can you quantify this? How can you quantify this to make sure that you can use it in a stock uh, screener and, and screen for that? Well, companies with a moat always have a gross margin larger than 40% and a return on invested capital larger than 15%. And when the gross margin and the return on invested capital are high and very stable, you also know that um, yeah, the company has pricing power, which is also a very interesting characteristic. And what is interesting about this, what is interesting about quantifying this is, like I said, that you can use it in a stock screener. Hey, it's Braden Dennis and Ryan Henderson interjecting here in the webinar to re-record the screener yesterday. We had around a thousand people live running our screener, which does use a lot of compute power, both through our AI engine and through our traditional screener. So we're going to rerun here live and show you the exact screen that Peter was building live on the webinar and run it for you. So there's one right out of the gate here. You can select industries, but Peter decided to exclude a bunch of things that he didn't uh, find had pricing power. He also included four metrics here. I'm going to add two more uh, that he was going to add here so you can see that process. So that one is operating cash flow divided by net income, and he wanted that uh, above 90%. So we'll grab here, um, right here. That's the correct one, right, right Henderson? And then uh, he wanted um, net debt to EBITDA under three. So net debt, we'll find net debt divided by EBITDA uh, less than three. So that will make the upper bound three. So it'll be negative infinity to, uh, to, to three. We could even do um, zero if we wanted EBITDA to be positive, but we'll just leave that. we'll just leave that there. All right, so I'm going to run this screener and now it's going to automatically build the table below, automatically sorted by market cap. I can adjust it later, but here is my results. 
uh, I can do more results and then I can even show more results per page. So I, it comes up with a lot of companies here. I can, I can go through, I can paginate, I can now sort uh, here. And then if I wanted to rerun the screener and so say I want to have more revenue uh, five-year CAGR, let's bump that up to say 13% if I wanted to do that, rerun the screener. I can do that. I can include more countries. I can exclude countries. I can include more or exclude more industries as well. And we've really stripped out a lot of what you'll see on traditional user interfaces for a screener and just have this one tab with all the boxes that you can adjust here and then exclude and include buttons. So that is the list here and it will automatically build out the table with the criteria that I've asked for at the top here. So that is the screener. We'll jump back into the webinar now. So right now we just filtered for, for the mode. We had two, these two criteria. Next part is obviously second part, the skin in the game. And Warren Buffett all, also said that, well, almost every manager of Berkshire Hathaway, every manager who works for Berkshire Hathaway is independently wealthy meaning that they don't need to run the business anymore for the money, they have enough, but they just genuinely love what they do and they focus on the creation of shareholder value. That is really important because you want the incentives of management to be aligned with the ones of you as a shareholder. And what you also see is that when this is the case, well, you actually perform good on the stock market. So companies with skin in the game outperform on average by three to 4% per year. And how are we going to quantify this? Well, you are looking for founder-led businesses, so companies where the founder is still involved and preferably the CEO of the business, and also an insider ownership of 10%, so family companies. And as a reminder here, so companies, when you solely uh, screen for skin in the game, well, those companies do 3 to 4% per year, better on average. And the same goes for, uh, for the moat. So remember the Morningstar White Moat Index, it outperformed by 4%. So just what we are trying to do here is we are trying to combine different metrics that on their own should already perform really well. And when you combine them, well, the performance even increases and the investable universe you create from that, and we will go deeper into that later. Well, this list will already perform really well. And based on that, you are going to build your portfolio. So the first part was the moat, second part, skin in the game. Third point is the low capital intensity. In short, the less capital a company needs, the better. And once again, when, we, when you would take the S&P 500 and you would take a bucket or create a bucket with stocks, they don't require a lot of capital to operate. And compared with a list that requires a lot of capital to operate, well, you will see that the low capital intensity, low capital intensity stocks dramatically outperform the market. Once again, this is also something you can quantify via FinChat. So you want you want to look for a capex on sales less than five percent, and a capex on operating cash flow uh, less than twenty five percent. And here maybe a little side note. Well, please look at the maintenance capex and not at the growth capex. I guess that uh, a lot of readers of Compound Equality know that because uh, obviously growth capex also creates a lot of value. And you also see it on the, on the table on the screen here, while the portfolio of compound and quality at capex on sales 4.2% versus around 20% for the S&P 500, that's exactly what you want to see. So here, once again, you can easily go to, to the stock screen of FinChat, enter capex on sales less than 5% and capex on cash from operations less than 25%, I took a screenshot of the output here. And now you see indeed, once again, a lot of great companies. Once again, it's filtered uh, via market cap. But for example, Arista Networks, just picking out one. Well, it's definitely a company I would love to own one day because they uh, benefit from AI. Uh, a bit too expensive in, in my view, but also under excellent companies, s and Global. So the credit rating agency company. Uh, think about Adobe. Um, today, I actually just finished an investment case in Adobe, should be published soon, and so on and so further. So this was the third criteria. Fourth one is uh, the capital allocation. So it's by far 
the most important task of management. Some of you will probably know Mark Leonard from Constellation Software. And what he basically said is when you have two identical or identic companies, identical companies, so the same balance sheets, active in the same industry, same growth outlook, um, same profitability and so on, but they make two completely different capital allocation choices. Well, in that case, you will end up with totally different results. So capital allocation is very important. Also what Buffett says, unfortunately is doing it alone right, uh, right now uh, until last year together with Charlie Munger. He, just, he always said, well, Charlie and I, we just sit in the office and we make capital allocation decisions and daily management and running the business and so on. It's done by people, uh, yeah, by managers who work for them, but they are not involved in that. So capital allocation is really crucial take uh, something to take away and together with the moat, the most important thing. And that's also, as an investor, you should always look at multiple things, but the return on invested capital is definitely one of the most important metrics for quality investors. So you want the return on invested capital to be larger than 15%. And when you do this, you will already filter out a lot of bad companies. So when you look at the output here, well, we have Costco here, right? It's a beautiful business. It was one of the favorite companies of Charlie Munger, uh, for example. Here we have Novo Nordics, Nordisk and Eli Lilly once again. Accenture is also a beautiful company. Maybe one thing to add is, uh, I think last week or maybe the week before, they published results and they were somewhat less below average. And uh, what's interesting and why I'm mentioning it is that because the, the results of Accenture are often a good indicator of what will happen to the economy. But just in general, all the companies mentioned here, you filter out a lot of bad companies already and you, you remain solely with good ones. Fifth point here, and I guess this one is very straightforward, um, profitability. The higher the profitability, the better. So you want to invest in companies that translate most revenue into earnings. But maybe more, even more important, you want to invest in companies that translate most earnings into free cash flow. So we have, for example, the book Stocks for the Long Run. And in the beginning, I saw in the Q&A that someone was asking for book recommendations. While well, Stocks for the Long Run is definitely one of them. Uh, next month, by the way, um, I will also publish The Art of Quality Investing. So a new book uh, under compounding quality. But in Stocks for the Long Run, basically there is a study and it says... Companies that translate the most earnings into fee cash flow outperform those that don't by 1.8%, 18% per year. So that's an amazing figure. And also a takeaway here, well, if you look at the business, don't look at the earnings, but look at the fee cash flow because it's way easier. Uh, it's a way better metric and it's a way more robust metric. How are you going to quantify this? How can you enter this in FinChat? Well, gross margin you want to be larger than 40% and a profit margin larger than 10%. So once again here, a lot of beautiful companies in the list. ASML uh, appears here for the first time. LVMH, company we're invested in, and so on, and so further. And this is how we're going to co combine all these criteria to find or to end up with an investable universe, which consists solely of quality stocks. Last point in the list here is the secular trend. So basically, what, why is this so important? Because in the long term, stock prices always follow the evolution of the intrinsic value of a share, right? And when you know that the free cash flow per share growth is one of the most important drivers for the intrinsic value per share, well, in that case, I think that's very straightforward to, to mention that companies that are in a secular trend, it's way easier for them to grow their free cash flow at attractive rates and also way easier for them as a result to grow their intrinsic value and their stock price. What are some examples of secular trends? Well, obesity, think about Novo Nordisk and Eli Lilly, uh, we already talked about. Urbanization, who benefits from that? Well, elevator companies like Otis, Kone. Digital payments, well, Visa and MasterCard, for example. Cybersecurity, a company like Fortinet. So those companies will continue to grow at very attractive rates in the uh, in the years to come. How are we going to quantify this? Well, revenue growth, you want this to be larger than 7%, and then earnings growth, 
larger than 9%. And once again, you want this to be the case for the past, so where the company managed to grow attractively in the past, but also where you think that the company will keep, keep will be will be able to keep growing at attractive rates in the future. Well, you scream for these companies once again. A lot of beautiful, beautiful uh, companies here: Novo Nordisk, Visa, Apple, Meta, Eli Lilly, ASML, and so on. So those quick are note: the... you can also use FinChat for forward estimates as well. Um, yeah. you can you can look at multiple quarters, multiple years in the future for all of those metrics you mentioned and many more too. Okay, exactly. So those are the six essential characteristics we are looking for. And once again, you are combining different metrics that on their own should already perform quite well. And then based on that, you are building your investable universe. And after that, your portfolio um, or with companies that only match these criteria and should already do really well. Think about the white modes who are performed by more than 4%. Think about the skin in the game. Think about companies that translate most earnings into free cash flow and so on. Over the next few slides, I'll go a bit faster given the, the time constraints we have and, and given the fact that we will have or leave a plenty of room open for Q&A. But the beautiful thing here, I guess, is that you can use stock screeners like FinChat to remove all the weeds or the bad companies and remain only with the flowers or the wonderful companies. And when we are going to talk about the criteria, the six criteria you mentioned, well, basically this is how you can combine all metrics and end up with an investable universe of around 200 stocks that already tend to perform quite well. Again, jumping in here for showing the screener after recording here on the webinar. Just going to add a couple more metrics that Peter was really keen on during the webinar and try to get this number a little bit lower to around that 150 company universe that he really likes to look at. And that includes gross margin above 40% was one of his key screening criteria. And then return on capital employed as well. We'll do a five-year average of over 15%. Where's that metric? There it is, 15%. Let's rerun this screener. Um, and, and see see exactly what the results come out from, from the slides here. Okay, so we've got the list down now a little bit, but it's still a little big. Let's let's increase return on capital employed up to 20. Uh, we'll, we'll increase the gross margin up to 45% and get a little more growth. Let's get, uh, let's get 12% 12, uh, 12 on the top line and 9% on the bottom line per share. Let's run that. I could exclude more industries as well. If I'd like, I could even go market cap smaller, but let's just see what we get here. All right. Brilliant. Perfect. So that's that 154 results. I can get more per page here uh, and scroll through this list. So this is this is what Peter was hinting at while building up the screener of getting this quality universe a little bit more narrow and how saying no to a lot of stuff gives you opportunity and optionality to say yes to high quality companies. All right, back to the webinar. This is an old screenshot of the companies that matched all these criteria, right? So once again, when you do this, you will notice that there are 250 companies left. And I'm quite comfortable to say that when in the long term, so when you would just buy an e or create an equal weighted ETF, basically, based on two, those 250 companies, that it will perform quite well in the long term because it combines many criteria that are quality and combined many criteria that on their own should already do quite well. Now, when you look at the portfolio of compounding quality, you see that there are actually three buckets. The owner operator stocks, so 60 to 70% of the portfolio that is invested in companies that are still run by their founder or a family company, monopolies or oligopolies, where only a few companies dominate the entire industry, and then last but not least, cannibal stocks, so quality stocks that are heavily buying back their own shares, right? We don't have too much time, so I'll keep it short here, but 
the essence here is that the majority is invested in the owner operator stocks and that the goal of the portfolio is to outperform the S&P by, by 3% per year on average. Question you can ask yourself, obviously, is are we able to outperform by 3% per year? And I think we are because based on the screen, and this is based on the, the fundamental criteria of FinChat, our portfolio looks way healthier than the one of the index, right? For example, when you look at the balance sheet, well, net debt on free cash flow, 1.8 versus 5.7. You also see capital intensity is way lower. Capital allocation, return on invested capital is three times as high as the S&P 500. Profitability, profit margin, twice as high as the S&P 500. Our companies have grown way harder than the index on average. And also the outlook uh, still looks way more attractive. And when you even, okay, it's true, when we look at the fourth PE ratio, the portfolio is slightly uh, more expensive than the S&P. But when you take into account the future growth, the PE ratio, it's already way lower. And basically, when you combine everything, you can conclude here that basically our portfolio consists of way better companies, fundamentally way healthier, better capital allocation, higher profitability, and the outlook also looks better, and all, only slightly more expensive than the index, and even cheaper when you, when you take into account future growth. So when you, when you know that, I guess that it's quite straightforward um, that the portfolio will continue to do well. And this is also something I quite like uh, about FinChat so far. And basically, this is not a portfolio, but just some companies that I'm interested in. So here you, for example, see the portfolio statistics. So you can basically ask for every statistic you want about your portfolio, and you can edit the metrics. And then you can choose um, which metrics you want to see, right? And you can just enable them. And that's how you can easily track your portfolio characteristics. And also when you enter your own companies um, in, the, in, the, in the dashboard here, you get the annual reports of all the companies, you get the press releases, you get the transcripts of the earnings call. So basically insider transactions and so on. So that's something really interesting and it's really handy to follow up on your portfolio and follow up on the major uh, news that is happening uh, within, your, uh, within your portfolio and within the companies that you own. Last but not least, a few examples. Well, Kelly Partners Group, I'll skip this one for today, but uh, partners know that it's a company I truly believe in and Brad Kelly is an amazing guy. For those who are going to OMA this year, well, Brad Kelly will also be there. So happy to meet him and uh, as well as everyone in this call who, is, uh, who will go to OMA to meet each other there. And the second uh, example I brought to you guys is MedPace. And MedPace is a CRO company. So basically what they do is they help clinical research organizations to, to do their clinical research, uh, basically. They help biotechnology companies to do their clinical research. Argus Trunle founded the company in 1992. He is still the CEO. He has a total wealth of 2.4 billion. And his wealth is invested for 2.3 million billion. So almost everything in stocks of MedPace. So this also means that he has skin in the game and that he will always put the creation of shareholder value first. And it's just in general, an amazing business. And that's why yeah, we are invested in the company right now. And what I will show over the next two minutes is basically just we go over the six characteristics by MedPace, right? So for example, remember the first um, characteristic was, does the company have skin in the game? Well, remember, companies with skin in the game, there are two criteria met. Well, gross margin should, should be larger than 40%. You see it's 66% right here. And also return on invested capital, well, 15%. Okay, here it's 14.3%. But for MedPace, you could actually exclude uh, stock-based compensation. And when you do that, they just, uh, it will double. What also interesting, for example, when you want to see the gross profit margin, you can also just search for it here, and then you can also create a chart. So, so that's how you can do it like this. And also you see it in many investment cases. And when you click on chart here, well, basically you can also export here, export it and use it in your own analysis and stuff like that. Share it on Twitter, stuff like that. 
So first point, well, do they have a competitive advantage? Yes, because the gross margin is very high, return on invested capital as well. Second part, skin in the game. Well, already told you, August Schwindler founded the company in 1992 and is still the CEO today. So yes, it is. Capital intensity. So you want the low capital expenditures on sales. So once again, using the search bar here is really handy and you can just search for the two metrics. We want this to be lower than 5%. And what you see here is that capital expenditures for MedPay is only 36.6 million, right? And a revenue of almost 2 billion. So meaning that they almost require no capital to operate something we love to see. So low capital intensity also takes that box. Return on invested capital and capital allocation also very interesting. So take a look at the return on equity, 30%. Return on invested capital, excluding goodwill, is actually 28%. Really attractive. Profitability, well, remember, we want the gross margin to be larger than 40% as well here. Well, 66%. Net income should be larger than 50, uh, larger than 10%, and it's actually 15%. So also um, very interesting. And then the, yeah, the last part we have is the secular trend, right? And you can see that here. So basically, when we look at it over the past 10 years, uh, MadPace has grown its revenue at a compound annual growth rate of 22.7%, EPS 21%. And what's also interesting, like Braden already mentioned, you can also look at the outlook here. So for example, the, the, the consensus, of capital IQ, the consensus of all analysts following the company state that our EPS should grow at a CAGR of 19.8% over the next two years and the long term by 18%. So they are still growing at very attractive rates. So that's something we love to see as well. And basically, this is also, for example, at Compounding Quality, we have a community. And let's also do it um, in a while here who ask questions, just looking at these metrics, and you can do that within 90 seconds, well, you can already tell whether something is a good business or not. And that's exactly what I also, maybe an exercise to do here, and it's the last one. And for the rest, we will leave it open to Q&A. Well, investing is all about saying no as soon as possible, because there is an inf information overload. And if someone has an interesting stock, um, let's go over it. Uh, via FinChat and determine together whether it's an interesting company or not. And let's do that within 90 seconds. So uh, maybe Ryan, if you can take a look and yeah, via the Q&A, some mention a company that someone is talking about and let's go over that one. Yeah, sure thing. So uh, everyone, if you've got a company you would like Peter to analyze here, just throw it in the chat. We've got a couple here. Let's start with uh, FICO. Uh, Someone put uh, FICO and Intuitive Surgical. So maybe we could take those two first. Okay. okay, let's do two. FICO, so beautiful company, right? So I don't know who mentioned it, but uh, it's a beautiful one. So also here, when you just go to FinChat, you hit the search bar and that's good. So let's go ahead. And it's interesting because it's a while that I took a look at it. Well, gross margin, fantastic, 80%. Um, return on invested capital is also good. So uh, the competitive advantage part is good. And um, profitability here also, it's a very profitable profitable business, 30% uh, net margin. Capital expenditures, well, to be honest, I don't know. So the beautiful thing here is it only takes 30 seconds or 10 seconds to find out, right? So capital intensity, very low. So love to see that as well. Capital allocation, already talked about that. 28%, good. Let's look at the secular trend part. Also very good, right? So they mentioned uh, they mentioned to grow at very attractive rates. So based on this, I, I would say, well, fair, uh, it's, FICO is definitely a, a, a quality stock. Maybe one thing to, in, uh, to mention or to add here as well, what I usually also do is just look at the stock price. And that already tells you a lot. So total return here, you want the compounded or I want the compounded annual growth rate of at least 12% since uh, the IPO. And here you see that since 1990, the compound annual growth rate is 23%. So is FICO uh, a quality business? For sure. 
And there's only one reason why I don't own a company yet at this point in time. And that's basically the valuation. And you can also beautifully cha chart that one here is that FICO is trading at quite rich valuation levels. So this is the evolution of the Ford PE, right? And you see that over the past 10 years, it's almost at an all time high. So here a Ford PE of 50 times earnings, obviously that's quite expensive. Um, and when you would run an earnings growth model and reverse DCF, well, in that case, um, yeah, the valuation looks quite rich. And, and obviously I want or prefer companies with a larger margin of, margin of safety. So if we want to, we can do one more intuitive surgical or and someone one, else. Uh, one really nice thing to um, Peter to show is you can overlay other fundamentals on the, on the valuation. Like if you were to bring in, like let's let's go let's go into the segments and KPIs tab for FICO. Yeah. And go to like the scores business, which is like the crown jewel of the business. Um, so if you click on that, and then the score, yeah, total scores revenue. If you just grab that one, that's their this is the kind of the the crown jewel of the business. Um you can kind of compare over time, like you know, is the run up in, is the multiple expansion, is it warranted or like, you know, is it just trading at a premium con compared to historicals? Like this is really helpful for high growth companies to kind of, you know, weight that in your, in your analysis. And then also if, if you're ever having any issues on graphing two items that have huge different Y axes, you can toggle the Y axis on the bottom right there. Um, where there the legend is so you can you can toggle that no problem okay perfect perfect and let's quickly do a intuitive surgical as well and then leave the space open for for q a or from for Brian. i'll also demo and drive the ask fin chat feature as well after and then sure. we can ramp up some questions okay perfect so so once again here gross margin 66 percent to an invested capital high, does the company have a moat? Short answer, yes. Capital intensity, once again, you can look for it really quickly. So here you also see, well, one and seven. Capital intensity is quite high, but that's obviously it's a bit of a, uh, because you have experience, right? What you should also look at Capital intensity, the, the, the CAPEX part, well, it's maintenance CAPEX and growth CAPEX. So when you see that capital intensity is high, basically what I do is just compare the capital expenditures with the depreciation and amortization. And when you see, and let's check out really quickly. So that's exactly what you see, right? You see that CAPEX is 1 billion, a bit more, and that depreciation and amortization is around, that's around 400 million. So this means that the difference is always growth CAPEX. And what you basically can do is just compare the depreciation and amortization with the revenues to look at the capital intensity because the growth capex will still create a lot of value um, in the future. So here, I think that the high capital intensity is no problem at all. You have a great capital allocation metrics. The profitability, as mentioned, looks high. Historical growth on 10 years, 10.5% compound annual growth rate for EPS in the long term should go by 13.5%. Also good. Maybe one additional one for these kind of companies. Also look at the stock-based compensation and how high it is because obviously stock-based compensation is also a cost for shareholders, right? So I always subtract them from valuation. I'll do that quickly. And this is something I really don't like to see. And this is something I, why I personally wouldn't invest in companies like, like Intuitive Surgical. You see that free cash flow is 750 million, but that almost all of that is basically stock-based compensation. So when you would subtract stock-based compensation here, well, almost no free cash flow is left over, right? So this is something why I would be quite wor worried of. And you see that the PE is 60 times and then taking into account the stock-based compensation, it's something I would like to avoid. And I guess, yeah, let's leave the rest of the presentation to, to Braden and for the Q&A, keep it interactive. But also maybe last thing to add here. Yeah, obviously, and, and partners already know it, 
if you are interested in, in, in using FinChat, yeah, you can basically just um, at the checkout, use the code compounding quality or scan the QR code and you get 25% off. Also in the community, the link is there. And I guess, yeah, for me also, like I mentioned in the beginning, beginning honesty, integrity, really important. Um, I genuinely believe that I love the product of, of FinChat and it can be completely transparent here. I, I used to use Bloomberg when I worked as a professional investor. Before I started talking with Braden, I used Refinitiv, which is basically something like Bloomberg, really, uh, really interesting. But I canceled that subscription but just because I think that FinChat is really good. So I would say uh, kudos to you, uh, Braden, and the entire team. And for the rest, I guess I'll leave the word up to you and uh, for the Q&A. All right, we got tons of questions and there was about 100 plus companies listed for you to analyze, Peter, but uh, I don't think we're going to be able to get to all of those. <laughs> so I'm trying to combine some of these questions here. Um, sure. A lot of the questions were kind of around when you think to sell a business. So what's kind of your exit strategy? When do you think, oh, I'm going to sell this? How long do you let something have inadequate performance to what you're hoping for before you decide I'm going to get rid of this position? Yeah, I think regarding exiting the position, well, two important things when to sell is one, well, life is a game of opportunity costs and the same goes for investing. So when you are invested, for example, let's let's take FICO, for example, beautiful business, but you seem to have found another business that is fundamentally as good, but trades at maybe instead of 50 times earnings, only 25 times earnings. Well, then it can make sense to make the switch, right? So when you find more attractive uh, opportunities, this is the first reason. And I guess the second reason, obviously, is when you made a mistake. So when you do your investment case, you make your homework. But but it seems like, for example, and let's let's take the example of, of text to say there. Uh, for me, well, you made the you made the investment case. You look at the company's moat. You think that the company has a sustainable competitive advantage. But after a while, it seems like okay, maybe my investment case was wrong and maybe the moat isn't as wide as I actually thought it was. Well, in that case, it's also a reason to sell a stock. And the beautiful thing is when you made your homework and your homework was correct, well, in that case, when you buy a compounding stock or a quality stock, the company will keep growing its, its intrinsic value at attractive rates. And you basically should almost never sell it. So in that case, you can just uh, let your winners run. Okay, quick follow up. Uh, this well, this is kind of a separate question, but how much time do you spend analyzing a company's competitors and the competitive set in general? I think really important when you look at the company. Always important to also look at the rivals and reading the earnings call, reading the 10K of the rivals can can provide you with a lot of information. Now, how much time do you spend on that? It's a tough question, right? Probably during the initial. Uh, phase the initial investment case spend a few hours on that five hours six seven eight hours and then obviously once you start to get seriously interested in a company you basically also or what i do is i usually also put all the competitors in a watch list and when they publish results um, i just read their 10k their their their, their quarterly results their earnings calls and so on to also learn for the businesses that you actually own Peter, I'm going to share my screen if I can sure. take over here. I'd like to show exactly how that can be done kind of out of the box too, which is which is quite helpful. So I just pulled up Walmart here in the top and just went on to the industry tab. So automatically you go to the financial tab. If I go to the industry tab, it's going to bring in just a general subset of companies that are in their comp set and then a bunch of metrics. All of these are editable. Um, so if, if you don't think that one company is a, is a good uh, comp set and you think, okay, I, I actually want to compare all retail, so I'm also going to bring in Home Depot, um, I can do so. Then I can remove a bunch and, and change metrics. I can bring in a bunch of the metrics that you care about specifically um, with your quality investing strategy as well, Peter. And then yeah. another easy way to do this is with a dashboard. So I have my portfolio, I have my watch list. I can create another one just call quality investing and I'll add in a bunch of stocks and maybe that I found from my my screener and 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 have 
a nice little tracking and notification system as well uh, around those companies, which is super helpful. Um, one thing I wanted to show, we just have a few minutes left. Let's take some more questions. I did want to show the Ask FinChat feature as well. Jumping in after the fact for the third and final time again with the overload on our screener and compute power during the webinar. We appreciate that everyone is so keen to try it out live. The feature I'm going to show here really quick is screening with AI. I showed lots of different features during the webinar live. Screening with AI is probably one of the things we're most proud of that works amazing. It's very powerful. And I'm going to build just a simple one here so I can say, provide me a list of U.S. companies with a market cap of less than 100 billion and growing revenue over the last five years by more than 25% uh, per year. So two criteria there, I guess third with the country and then lots of parameters on timeframes, compound annual growth rates and uh, greater than less than. So we'll run that screener. Uh, it's now going through and looking through 57,000 active listings on the platform and giving me this list. It's really amazing because not only do I get this list summarized, I get a quick idea of what each company does as well, which is quite nice. But I also get this list here in a table. Now you're ask, you're going to notice one thing. I asked for country US, I asked for revenue, and I asked for market cap and it put it automatically into the table as well as built it out into my screener here. Now I can even interact with it. I can add other countries as well um, and, and, and reiterate and regenerate the screen. I could add more metrics. I could adjust this to you know 200 billion in market cap if I'd like and run from there. All right, last, uh, last one of me interjecting back to the end of the webinar here. Again, appreciate everyone joining live. Um, we got more more questions and um, and uh, stuff here. One thing that I wanted to ask you, Peter, is we talked a lot about metrics and a lot about different screening criteria. What about different qualitative things in that intuitive surgical or that FICO example? What are you reading? What are you looking at? What are you looking at in terms of the company's public relations and, and investor relations to analyze the company from zero to one on the quality and the, the moat that they might have? I think, I think most important thing, just in general, read as much as you possibly, possibly can. And right now we are both quite gifted, right? Because this is your full-time job. But to give you an indication, since the beginning of the year, I keep track of, of all the books I read. And I guess that I'm, I read 35 books since, uh, since uh, the beginning of this year to just keep reading. But to take it one step further, well, also my, my agenda is quite structured. Every day, every morning from 5 to 7 a.m., I read a book. From 7 to 9 a.m., I usually first have breakfast for, for 10, 15 minutes. But then I just read one 10K every day um, and that just helps to compound your knowledge and obviously the companies within your watch list and the companies you're interested in just read everything you possibly can for example yeah when you're interested in, in fico to give an example well when you read the 10k of this year read the 10k of last year and also read the the, the 10 law latest earnings call of the business well you already learn a lot and within the earnings call Maybe they mentioned a certain rival. You also start to read them, their 10K and stuff like that. So it's basically some kind of web that you keep digging deeper and deeper. And it's also really interesting. And that's the thing, I guess, when you start researching a company, you can make your investment case. And that's really good. You, you've done your own work. But then when you decide that it's a good business, well, you always keep learning about the business. And every quarterly report, every earnings call, every new 10K, every... Every, every media article mentioning the company, you learn something new. So it's just about, you have compounding quality, you have compound interest, and you also have compound knowledge. And I think that's very important. All right, we got a lot of questions around valuation. So Brayden or Peter, feel free to, uh, both you guys can chime in here. How do you think about valuation? And then- 
how do you use FinChat in sort of the valuation process? If you want, you can go first, uh, Braden, and I will go afterwards. <laughs> sure. Okay. No problem. So when it comes to valuation, you know, you did touch on a lot of the screening criteria. A lot of people in the chat were asking about, okay, well, you know, why is there no EV to EBITDA under 50 in there or something like that? I'm not going to speak for Peter, but when I personally screen for quality, because I am a quality investor as well, I do my valuation second. Um, and that doesn't mean, don't hear what I'm not saying, that doesn't mean it's not as important. It is the utmost important. The, the reason for that is that I'm trying to create a universe of companies to look at further and then decide if there's a, a fair price to be, to be had. And the, the reason for that is I want to get a universe of the greatest companies on earth uh, that, are, that are growing, they have secular trends behind them, then they have uh, real sustainable competitive advantages and then do my work after and determine if they're a fair price to be paid. That FICO example trading at what, 60 times next year's earnings, it's a fantastic business. Everyone knows that. Everyone knows the scores business is kind of like a pure play monopoly on uh, credit rating scores. However, it's growing low, sing low double digits. Um, maybe the score segment's growing a little faster. They have a lot of pricing power. They're also under immense regulatory pressure right now, as of right now, uh, the latest news for that business. So I think that it's a very high price to pay for what is obviously a fantastic business. I think everyone really knows that, but uh, it, it is it is quite expensive trading at those types of multiples. So to answer a question around about way, valuation, utmost importance, but I do it after I get my universe of names I want to dig into first. From, for me, basically the same. I remember from the beginning of the presentation, well, basically one of the companies at a fair price, right? So first you look for one of the companies, beautiful management. And after that, basically based on those two criteria, you're building your universe. And only after that, you are looking at valuation. And regular readers of compounding quality will know that. And I use FinChat actually. I always look at three things when I look at valuation. First thing, and you can do that in 10 seconds, and that's why I do it, because it's really quick and dirty as a rule of thumb. Just chart the Ford PE and see, like FICO, for example, well, when it's at an all-time high, you don't want to see something like that, right? Obviously, really quick and dirty and a bit short-sighted. But after that, always do the earnings growth model. So your return and as an investor is always equal to the same. Is the earnings growth of the future plus the shareholder yields, plus or minus the changes in valuation. So the earnings growth, well, you can look at that in FinChat. And remember, we showed it, you can look at the EPS, long-term growth estimates. So you can use that one. Then you take the shareholder yield, which is a dividend yield and the buyback yield. Also really easy to find, can do that in 10 seconds once again. And then the changes in valuation. So for example, let's give an example like LVMH. Well, LVMH today trades at 25 times earnings. Obviously, what I'm doing, trying to do next is I'm trying to look for a reasonable long-term average valuation level for LVMH. So for me, that's around 20 times earnings. And basically, then you make the assumption that the PE will go down from 25 times earnings to 20 times earnings. And you take that into your calculations. And when you do the math, and it's easier on paper, but... You do the earnings growth of 10% plus the shareholder yield of 2% and a yearly multiple contraction for LVMH around 2%. where well, you get an expected long-term return of 10% for LVMH. Then the question is up to you uh, to determine whether a return of 10% per year is good for you or, or not. So that's what I do for every position. Last thing is reverse DCF. So basically you just look at what is implied in the current stock price, right? So when you want a return of 10% per year, at which rates should the free cash flow grow over the next 10 years in order to achieve that? And for example, for LVMH right now, it will be around 10%, something like that. But when you know that Bernard Arnault has said during the latest earnings call that they will keep growing their revenue organically by 9% per year, and that should translate in a free cash flow growth of 13 to 15% per year in the years to come, well, in that case, you see that the growth implied in the stock price is lower 
than than the expectations than the expectations of management and also your own expectations and that's an indication that the stock might be undervalued so for me i don't use ta technical analysis or something like that just buy good good businesses at prices that make sense Wonderful. That uh, basically wraps up the core of our presentation. I'm going to stick around for a few minutes um, and answer some of the most common questions that we're getting here about the platform. One I've seen a lot is, does it have you know, stocks in Turkey? I saw was one of the questions. Does it have stocks in Japan? Was one of the other questions. It has all public listings globally uh, for, for all equities. Um, it did another question. No, it does not cover crypto. Um, it's a platform for global in, uh, individual equities. Um, and the data source is another question that I'm getting a lot. Use a combination of the FinChat data feed for segments and KPIs. So if you're talking about Netflix, you can track their membership counts, that kind of stuff. And then estimates and con uh, consensus estimates and fundamental financials are from S and P Market Intelligence. So all the data is really high quality and, and institutional. Um, yeah, there's 250 questions here. So uh, we, we can keep uh, hacking away at people on them that people want to stick around. But uh, for, for people that got to get back to stuff, totally understand that that wraps up the webinar. You can use code compounding quality, uh, all one word to get 25% off in chat today. All right. What do we got here? Brayden, there's a question around how to uh, how to find insider ownership uh, and whether or not you can do that with Fincha. Yep, for sure. So the the easy way to navigate individual companies, you, you search them up and then there's a financials tab. Uh, here, let me just get the visual for people to see. I have way too many tabs open today, folks. All right. So there's the financials tab. There's the earnings tab. This is where you're going to be able to see the earnings call and you're going to to listen to the audio right in here. It's awesome. It'll, it'll co uh, coordinate with the transcript right here. You can see the report, which is, uh, this is for Q4 2024. So this is like their press release that they announced their, Walmart's results. And if necessary, some companies will also report slides. Uh, so this is their financial presentation that they do every quarter. It's really nice, really easy to go through. Next is analysts. So this is forward estimates. Uh, revision histories and revision trends are also shown here. Price targets. Um, so you can see also price targets on the high end, the median, and the low end. Now you can see industry, which is really helpful. You get a quick view of the of the people in their comp set, but you can also edit it and save. So I have auto save on. So if I change, I don't want Costco in this list, I can remove it and it'll auto save for the future if that's what I wanted to do. Uh, modeling, you get kind of like a DCF out of the gate, out of the box. I saw a question on this. So yes, this is available. I'm just going to... Which includes the estimates as well. Includes the estimates. Yeah, it's automatically bringing in the estimates from before. The dividend history, which is super helpful for all my dividend uh, investors out there and, and dividend growth people. The question about ownership, here you go. This is where it is. We can see institutional ownership here, as well as insiders. Uh, you're able to track insider transactions and you'll get a list also of all transactions of owners over 5%. So they don't necessarily need to be a insider per se. Uh, they just need to have over 5%. So like Vanguard and BlackRock will be in there as well. And then there's a complete filings viewer as well. So you can see their 10Ks, like uh, Peter mentioned, he reads 10K a day. Um, he can go on here, go and read Walmart's 10K right here. Pretty awesome. So that, that, that answers your question and also answers probably 15 other questions there in the chat. There are a lot uh, of questions. Oh, sorry. Go yeah, ahead. Go, go. There, there are a lot of questions around pricing and, and what you get with the different tiers. So can you maybe go through uh, the trial we're doing now with the FinChat Pro and then some of the differences between the different plans? Yeah, for sure. 
let's let's use an example here. So um, here is one of my built out things that I auto save here. I like to compare the cloud, the business of the cloud between the hyperscalers, the Amazon, Google, and Microsoft. So I, I always have this updated and it automatically updates. Here's an example of something you'd get on pro is this like really granular data. You get all of our history. So the data history goes way back. You get unlimited AI prompts and the charting in terms of data history goes way back, way, way back. So if I did like total revenues and I just kind of hid these ones, let's hide these ones. I'm able to go back 20 quarters in a row for all these companies. Um, I can do it by company here as well. And you see, you're just getting a lot more quality of life. You're, the screener results are way longer. You can auto save more tabs. You can build more dashboards. You're unconstrained on the notifications. On FinChat Pro, you basically, there's just no really constraints. There's You get everything. And then plus, which is the middle tier, which is just $29 a month, gives you almost all the history, but without a lot of the like unlimited aspect of it. So if, if for those who are budget conscious, it's a great option to get, you know, a good amount of the product without maybe all the bells and whistles. Whereas FinChat Pro, if you're doing serious investing um, and, and, you know, take your portfolio management and research very seriously, you're not going to run into any limitations with FinChat Pro. You get everything uh, fully unlocked. Okay, looking through some of the other questions here. You've already touched on the transcripts. Um, maybe, I guess, uh, a question for Peter to give viewers an idea of the value that they get out of it. What are some, what are parts of FinChat that you use the most? I know you talked a lot about the screen or other, other pages as well. Yeah, I guess I'm a fundamental guy, right? So I prefer to love the, the fundamental data and also the earnings call transcripts and so on. And something I also really love and something we, we also didn't touch about uh, upon uh, earlier this meeting is, is, I guess, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Braden, if you have the, the pro subscription, you can also download, download all the fundamental data in Excel. So for me, that's also yeah, really, really, really interesting. So via the FinChat add-in to 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 get these uh data right not I... not really uh kind of um you you can't export the data just like with one broad click you can from the dashboard yeah. uh, from the dashboard if you create all all of your portfolio and all those metrics you can think of the dashboard as like your own excel plugin that's always updated because the pricing's real time mm -hmm. and and all the data comes in right after the quarters come in so the dashboard is a good way to think of that. Um, other features were a little bit limited from what we're able to do with data provi providers, but you have kind of full full reign in terms of exporting and copying the data from the dashboard feature. Yeah, exactly. And also I saw it uh, in the Q&A, some people asked about the recording and stuff like that. I guess the, the presentation, so the PDF of the slides as well as the recording will be made available to, to all of you quite shortly. So uh, feel free to to share it and to rewatch it and, and do everything you want with it. Or that's the <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that's Within exactly reason. right. Yeah, the uh, uh, there are some questions around uh, tracking super investors as well. Braden, do you want to kind of show off that feature and what we've got there? Yeah, it's super fun. So if I'm just curious about uh, the buff dog, I can just type in that. And I'll type in Warren Buffett and I'm just going to get the Berkshire Hathaway 13F view in a really nice, concise way. I'm going to get all these kind of stats and I'm going to also get changes in the portfolio over time. I can see the entire portfolio. If I just show a hundred here, um, I'm going to see that portfolio. I can see how it's changed over time. So say I wanted to see, okay, but what was it like in Q4 of, uh, of um, 2016? So it's kind of nice to kind of go back and just see, see this stuff historically as well as if i go into the companies i can list it look at all the companies that are in the holdings today and see the history of it as well and how much so here's the you know the, the historic apple position from from berkshire and how it's climbed up as such a big part of the portfolio 
and uh, when they kind of went all in. Uh, so you're able to see that historical. And then filings directly from these 13F filers is in the third tab here. So I can see that. Um, you're, you're, you can see here uh, as it loads <laughs> um, what you would get when it's locked, when you're not on a pro subscription, for instance, here. And uh, I can go on my admin console and show you what that exactly looks like. And uh, every time I share my screen, just on Zoom, Google Meets doesn't have this issue, but when I share my screen on, on Zoom, it uh, makes my browser very slow. But um, yeah, so that, that, that gives you hopefully a good overview of the different uh, things you can do with 13F filers like a, like a Buffett. Yeah, the other tab that I personally really enjoy there is if you look under the investors tab, there's the hedge fund letters. Yeah. And we compile all of them into one list. And I think it's really useful. If you like tracking hedge fund managers and you like seeing what they write, there's always some, they're all right there. And it's, I, I personally love going there to, to read different letters. Yep. Good call. That's a good little aspect of it as well. Okay. Anything we didn't touch on today that we think is, worth noting the earnings tab is helpful especially come earnings season for all your portfolio companies and you can throw in uh if if using your dashboard you can have the next earnings date show yep. up easily yeah this is um my favorite part of the platform overall is like home base um, when it comes to the portfolio and my watch list so i keep two tabs portfolio and watch list I might mess around with some other ones, but these are the mainstays. And then I'm able to see notifications specifically on those names. So we've got Accenture and uh, Lululemon that have most recently reported in the watch list, but I can scroll down and see more. If I wanted to see this press release that came out from, let's do CrowdStrike, the more growthy name, let's click on that. It's going to bring me right into that to read it. So the notifications panel and the dashboard are really, really helpful for management of my portfolio and my watch list and staying on top of things, as well as it's completely replaced my need for an Excel add-in because all the metrics I care about right here, I just do it in here. And I, I, I love Excel. Excel is like the greatest platform, greatest horizontal software tool ever made. But the fact that it automatically keeps everything updated right in the browser here and a lot more easier to work with and have everything in one place, it's it's quite nice. Okay, Tr just trickling through some of the remaining questions here, just to re-harp on what Braden already said. You can export your dashboard and you can include, I think we have like almost 500 different metrics that you can include on the dashboard. So there's a lot of customizability there. Um, is there anything we didn't touch on, Braden, that you think is really important uh, platform-wise that people get a lot of value out of? Oh, just like how fast we're moving. Like if there's a metric that you didn't see, I saw someone was asking about, can we put in CapEx to sales? Like that's something you just put in the support ticket and we'll have it in by the end of the week. Like we're a fast moving team where if there's something in there that's part of your workflow or core metric that you'd like to see, or even a feature, I think you'd be pleasantly surprised at how quickly we would build it out for you. Or if um, there's a company that we don't have KPIs that we track for, then add it into our coverage is, is a very manageable uh, ask. No problem. All right. I think we answered as many questions as we could. Uh, but thank you everyone for getting the uh, the questions in the chat there. And uh, I'll let Braden and Peter kind of close things out here. For all attendees that have come, well, first of all, thank you very much. Uh, and, and, and thank you on behalf of us at FinChat, Peter, aka Compounding Quality for, for coming on to do the webinar and talk quality investing. You know, the, the math and the back test definitely checks out high quality companies tend to have high quality results. And, um, and, and thank you for sharing all that knowledge with us. Henderson's going to follow up with all attendees for uh, the slides, uh, recording of this presentation and a recap of this offer of anyone today can use the code compounding quality for 25% off. Um, but Peter, we thank you attendees. We thank you. And, and Peter, if you have any closing thoughts, we'd love to hear them. 
Yeah, also from my side, just uh, saying thank you for everyone who attended and uh, for being uh, with so many today. So as already mentioned, 250 questions. So that's amazing, right? And I guess, yeah, I genuinely like the product. I genuinely love all people and partners within compounding quality. So also in the community, I just posted something about it. Feel free to react on that. And if there is a certain question that wasn't answered, just copy paste it there and I'll free to I'm happy to go over it and let's keep helping each other let's keep compounding and uh, become better investors all together